Good afternoon. Welcome to the last talk for uh, day one. I hope you've had a great time um, here already. I would like to introduce uh, Tanya. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Those of you who know me from Twitter, I'm the crazy bunny lady. If you don't know me from Twitter and you like bunny rabbits, please follow me. I'm at Tanya on Twitter. <laughs> All right, so I'm here to talk to you guys today a little bit about getting started with JavaScript bundling. And I'm going to do that through some examples with Webpack. So um, if you already know Webpack inside out, I suggest leaving or sitting quietly at the back because uh, you might get a bit upset with my very simplified version of uh, what's going on here. So programming is a battlefield. We all know that. In many ways, it's a battlefield, but in one way in particular, code for people versus code for computers. We're always figuring out, should we be optimizing for the way this is going to run in the browser, or should we be writing this in a way that is appropriate for that poor next developer who's going to be looking at it? <laughs> um, I tend to err on the side of making it easier for other programmers, but in a perfect world, we want our code to work for both without sacrificing the needs of either. So some of the things that people like. People like many files. We like to split up our code into pieces that make sense as standalone files. Um, we like our files to have comments to actually explain what they do. We like to have debug support, our console logs and our debugger points. Um, and we really like to have descriptive naming. However, our good friend the computer likes to have None of that. One file if possible, as few files as possible. No waffle, none of this extra stuff, no comments. Take it all out, get rid of it. I only want the stuff I need to run. So some of the things we want to do to our files when we want to take them from dev to production is mush them all together. So we want to cut down the number of files we're actually delivering to the browser. We want to remove as many comments and debugs and all that kind of thing as possible. Remove unused code if possible and compress all white space. So many of you will be familiar with um, using task runners, such as Grunt and Gulp. Yeah? Can I actually have a show of hands? Who has used Grunt or Gulp? Everyone, right? <laughs> OK, cool. Because I know there's a few students in here may not have made it even that far yet. Um, Grunt and Gulp just allow you to take your files and basically make them smaller, package them up a little bit um, for the browser. But now we've got this, this concept of a bundler. And a bundler is a little more complex than a, um, a task runner in that it actually intelligently bundles. It will take your files and actually follow the source and follow your imports and find out what you're actually using, not just what you say you're using. Now, I do just want to <laughs> mention, yes, these tools are command line tools. And uh, in the good words, uh, in the friends of my, ugh, <laughs> in the words of my good friend, Walter Runsby, uh, if you are afraid of the command line, don't be afraid of the command line. You can dislike the command line. That is OK, but don't be afraid of it. It can be really, really powerful. So what I have here is a beautiful website. Let's see if this is going to run. It should be a video. Yep, all right. I have a beautiful website about the zany zebra. And this is a very simple website written in HTML and CSS. And it's got a couple of really simple JavaScript files that all they do is a, a console log. And what we're going to do is go through how we would bundle this very simple website using Webpack. So our very first step is we want to separate out our source and our distribution. So we're going to take all of our source code, keep it in one place, and have it be migrated over to our output folder automatically. So for example, you may have a project, my project, that has your JavaScript folder, your CSS folder, and your index.html. We're going to take all that code, dump it in a source folder, and create, using Webpack, what goes in our distribution folder. So let's have a look at how we do that very, very simply. Actually, I can skip over this. You guys know how to copy files, all right? I'm just going to copy everything into the source folder. Cool. All right, next up. Manage your project with NPM. So we'll go over this very quickly because some people haven't used NPM yet. NPM is a command line tool. We run it from the command line. We use it to install things, manage packages, all that jazz. Um, so 
inside a project, so you use the command line to go into your project, and then uh, your first step to manage that project with npm is to simply run npm init. Now running npm init, I should have made these videos run automatically, all right. Um, if you run npm init, all it does is creates a file called package.json. And that package.json describes your project. You can see in this video that I've just run it and pressed yes, 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 accept all the defaults, and it's created this file here. Now, an interesting part of this file that we will be using is that part in the middle that says scripts, because scripts allow us to run custom scripts on our project in a very easy way. So setting up Webpack, once we've got our project managed with NPM, we can install Webpack. Once again, very simple. From the command line, we npm install webpack, and we save dev. Now, this save dev flag means that we want to save that dependency that we want to use webpack into that package.json file. So if somebody else comes and takes our code, they know that they also need webpack installed. The other part we want to do is create a new script called dev. Dev is mapped to the command webpack. And that means that any time inside our project we run npm run dev, it's actually in the background going to run webpack for us. The other part is to create a webpack config. Now this is a very, very, very basic webpack config, and I really wanted to look at this because every time I tried to search for webpack config, when I was trying to get started with webpack, everybody's examples are around a million lines long. I don't know if anybody else has noticed that. Everybody's got their plugins and their customizations. This is the bare minimum. There's a, couple, there's a couple more lines we have to add. We're going to look at that, but <laughs> this, is, this is your starting point. So creating those files in your project. You guys tweeting about me. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, npm install webpack, and we save dev, and that's going to save it to our package.json once it's installed. I tried to look for a way to make these go double speed, but Keynote's really limited. <laughs> also, this is 3G, so it's not, it's not the greatest. But you'll see that uh, um, under dev dependencies, Webpack has now shown up as a dev dependency, and that will be saved for anyone else who uses this project. We add in that script, so we say any time we're going to write in npm run dev, please run Webpack. My really slow one finger typing because I was holding my phone in the other hand. <laughs> All right, and we create a webpack config that contains that code that we looked at before. Now, if we try to run webpack at this point, we are going to get a failure. And that's because webpack does require a bare minimum of an input and an output to be defined. Now, everything around Webpack is to do with bundling JavaScript. So the first thing we're going to do is actually bundle our JavaScript and just not worry about our HTML and CSS just yet. So bundling your JavaScript. First, we have to define the Webpack entry and output. This is our Webpack config that we just looked at. Entry, we give a path to our index.js. Not all of you may use an index.js. That's OK. Start using one if you want to use Webpack. It makes it a lot easier. Um, and defining an output, which is, consists of a file name and a path where you want to export all of your files, which is normally a folder called dist. But that's up to you. Now, this concept of an index.js is because Webpack needs a single entry point to decide where, uh, where to start the tree of files it wants to follow to include. So by having an index.js, and you say, this is my starting point, you can then import any files you want into that index.js file, and it will include them from there. Just as if I now had in file1.js another import, it would also pull that file in. So it follows the tree from your starting point. This is the simple stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll put these videos online later in case you want to see it reproduced. But, um, the code's fairly straightforward. So we've made those modifications. We've created our index.js. And now we have run Webpack and got our bundle. And the bundle looks really disgusting. 
But don't panic, because you don't have to look at it, right? That's the point. It's for the computer. Um, but you can see that I've got my uh, event listener and my onclick and my console.log zebras are so awesome. Uh, that stuff there is what is in my file one and file two. So you can actually stop at that point. If you just want to get started with Webpack, bundle your JavaScript, get that bit working, just remap your files to that output, that dist folder. That could be a really good place to begin. But Webpack is a lot more powerful than that. It actually allows you to also bundle your CSS and your HTML. So the way to bundle HTML, the most straightforward way, is to use the plugin HTML Webpack plugin. And we install this just the same way. npm install HTML Webpack plugin, save it to our list of um, dependencies. And then our Webpack config again. Um, bring an HTML Webpack plugin, and now we get to look at our first plugin. Um, plugins allow us to modify steps in the build process, in the, in the bundling process. So each plugin that you decide to use will have different options associated with it. Some of them you don't have to put any options. Some of them have a minimum number of options, like in a Webpack plugin, you probably want to put in the template, because that is your index file you want to include. And this is an interesting part of bundling your HTML, is you actually want to go into your index.html and delete your script references. Because your script references are now going to be injected by Webpack. The Webpack HTML plugin finds your index.html, bundles up your JavaScript, and puts a link to that JavaScript in your index.html before it outputs. So let's have a look at that, because that sounds a little bit confusing. So I'm going to install, not Webpack, <laughs> HTML Webpack plugin. So each time we do this npm install, it's actually downloading uh, that new thing into our node modules folder. So the node modules holds all of these things that we've downloaded with npm. If we modify our Webpack config, we can add uh, a new plugins array. So you can have as many plugins as you want, and you can also use the same plugin multiple times within Webpack. So we're doing a new HTML Webpack plugin, and we're going to configure that to use our index.html as the template. And I forgot to import it. <laughs> Better go back and do that. You'll see now that when we run this, it actually uh, will look in the dist folder, and you'll see that the index.html has come through. It's exactly the same as our template, except for that extra injected script that goes at the very bottom of the body. So make sure you delete those script references. JS1 and JS2, off you go. Don't need you anymore. That's going to be combined down to that one file called bundle.js, which we already created, but will get injected. And now when we run our dev, Webpack does its thing, says everything's OK. And if we check in our dist folder, now we've got not just our bundle.js, but also our index.html. And now at the very bottom of that index.html, the end of the body, Webpack has injected, or the HTML plugin, in fact, has injected that bundle.js for us. So you could even stop there, right? You can just add on these bits piece by piece. All right, but we'll look at bundling your CSS. So let's. NPM install, style loader, and CSS loader. So now we're looking at loaders. Loaders are a different concept from plugins. Plugins modify your bundling process, whereas a loader tells Webpack how to load a file of a specific type. 
So a loader might be for loading CSS or for loading TypeScript or for loading HTML. And to use loaders, we apply rules. So we create a rule that says for files of this type, use these loaders. And once again, we're going to delete that CSS. Except for this time, Webpack does something very strange. It doesn't inject styles.css in there. What it's going to do is take all of your CSS, package it up, and put it in your JavaScript. <laughs> right, there is a way to make it not do that. You can make it take your CSS, put it in a separate file. There's this thing called the extract text plugin. It's not too hard to use, but I did want to leave it out for the purposes of this talk. And this is what you do. This is more blah, but you know, this is how things are these days. Everything's in JavaScript. So <laughs> you go to your, your index.js and you import your CSS in there at the top because this is our entry file. And so when Webpack comes in here, it goes, oh, you want some CSS? Yeah, I can deal with that. That's cool. OK, we don't need to go through this again. We've, we've done all this. This is fairly straightforward. OK, so this is what happens now when we npm run dev after having made those changes. Ah, uh, error. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, the reason that there is an error going on is because in your CSS, quite often you want URL links, right? You want to pull in images in your CSS. But Webpack hasn't been told yet how to deal with images. We told it how to deal with HTML, and we told it how to deal with, well, it knows how to deal with JavaScript. We haven't told it how to deal with these things if it comes across a URL, because it's trying to follow all paths it can find. So what we need to do is comment it out. That's easy, right? <laughs> That's a good solution. Just don't use images in your CSS. Who needs them? <laughs> No, OK, we, we will, uh, it, it does work at that point. Um, if you comment out your, your URLs, it, yeah, it's happy now. We get green, but that's not actually going to help our website look any good. So we want to know how to bundle our images. Remember we talked about loaders and how loaders know how to load certain file types. We need a file loader and a URL loader. Those will help us load images. So once again, npm install, we need our file loader, we need our URL loader. But we actually only configure the URL loader. So we say every time you come across a JPEG, once again, you probably want to add in a few more. You know, we don't just use JPEGs these days. <laughs> add in, uh, so this test here, right? When you create a rule, you've got a test, and the test is the type of file to look for. That is a regular expression. Don't panic. It's OK. It's not a difficult regular expression. <laughs> In fact, you can even Google them if you don't want to figure out how to write it yourself. There's plenty of examples. But this says, every time you find a JPEG, please use the URL loader. And the reason that we only need the URL loader, despite installing the file loader and the URL loader, is because URL loader has a dependency on file loader. The reason for that is if it's going through your code and it follows a link to a JPEG and that JPEG is over a certain size, it's going to copy it to your output folder as an actual file. So if that's what happens when it's oversized, what happens normally? This is a bit more blah. It gets put in the JavaScript, right? <laughs> OK, so it follows this file link. You've got a nice little icon. It's your logo or something. What it does is it grabs that file, turns it into a base64 encoded string, and puts it straight into your CSS. And then your CSS goes straight into your JavaScript. How's that sound? <laughs> Once again, there's ways to stop this. If you really don't want that, then you, you can tell it to extract all images as actual images. That's, that's fine. But the default setting is to package all this up. And the reason for that is Webpack is really built for these one-page apps, where you want to load it once and have it ready every time the person comes back to that app. You don't want it going off to the server all the time, finding these images, loading lots of individual little things. So we modified our code. I'm going to skip this again, because it's no fun watching me write really slowly. But we will look at what happens when we run it. Okay, we get green. And this is with 
uncommenting, sorry, I skipped over, I uncommented that image link in the CSS. Did I? I don't remember. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> now I'm going to uncomment it. All right, so it was green. We're going to uncomment that and check that it still works with it uncommented. We've still got green. And that image now is this one at the top of my website. Because I wanted it to fit, I imported it in my CSS, because that's the easier way to do it. But all my HTML images are still missing. <laughs> <laughs> so I told it how to load images that come through a URL, but I didn't tell it how to do it for stuff that comes through the HTML. So. If we want it to do that as well, we need to make sure that our HTML also goes through a loader, because that means we want to pre-process it. Loaders are for pre-processing. So if we install an HTML loader, we do a test that says, when you find an HTML file, please also pre-process that. It will then use the URL loader for our HTML and our CSS. And this time when we run, We still get green. And if I refresh the page, we'll see that all of my images are now showing up. So those have all been injected into the HTML as base64 encoded strings. Cool, right? <laughs> Love that base64. I'm not even going to show you the output code. It's horrific. OK. So. Um, so most of the time, uh, when, you're, when you're developing, you want to run a dev server. Um, Thought I'd throw this in here because you, you're never going to uh, survive uh, running this crazy Webpack stuff without a dev server. So let's install one. npm install Webpack dev server. Save it. This time, what we want to do is find that dev command that we created earlier. And instead of running Webpack directly, now we want to run Webpack dev server. And Webpack dev server runs Webpack in the background for you as well as starting up a local web server. You can configure your dev server. You don't have to. It's up to you. I had some crazy conflicts, so I wanted to choose what port I was using. This is really handy as well um, when you're running one-page apps um, because you use a lot of URL manipulation. Quite often, you want to make your dev server understand the actual location of that app, especially if it's, if it's um, in a subfolder. All right. More installing, npm install, over 3G. <laughs> OK. All right, so changing our dev script to instead run Webpack dev server. Adding into our Webpack config that dev server setting. And now when we run dev, we don't just get a build, we get a dev server. Actually, we don't get a build at all. <laughs> it's a fun thing I actually only found out today is when you run Webpack dev server, none of the files actually get output to your dist folder anymore. It keeps them in memory while you're previewing, and then you have to create a separate command for doing a build for a release. But that's cool. We don't mind that. So you can see now that it's running on localhost 9000 as per the settings that I put in. If I update something on the page and save it, and then go back to check my page, it's updated automatically. So it's got that live reload running as well. It will watch all the files in your project, and if you make a change, your um, results are shown immediately. All right, our good friend, the source map. Because now we're doing some crazy munging. We've got our CSS going into our JavaScript. We've got these images coming into our CSS, into our JavaScript and strings. And it's going to be kind of hard to find when there's an error where that error is coming from, because all of our code now is just a big bleh. Error at line 2064 of bundle.js. Not very helpful. So what we do is we enable the dev tool. 
To get your source maps working for JavaScript, the only thing you need to do is add dev tool and then choose one of the dev tool options. There's about eight of them that Webpack offer. Eval is the fastest one. It's also the least accurate, but it's accurate enough. I've never noticed any issues with it. Um, you may notice your build time slowing down if you choose one of the more complex um, source map options. So dev tool is to make sure it works for your JavaScript. When you want source maps for your CSS, you need to add this flag to your loader. So our CSS loader, which we already have, we're saying, please also, when you read that original CSS, keep track of the lines where stuff came from and build that source map as you go. So let's have a look at how that looks. If we inspect something at the moment, you can see that it says it's in style, where it's lovely, lovingly injected into the page by Webpack. That is not very helpful. We want to know which line it comes from. So we go to our Webpack config. We will enable DevTool. Um, usually put it right at the top, but it's up to you. Choosing eval because it is the fastest option. And then also adding that to our CSS loader to make sure that we have line numbers for our CSS. Now, when you make changes to your Webpack config, you do actually have to stop the script and start it again. It doesn't automatically pick up those config changes. So that was me stopping the server and starting it again. And now you'll see that we get styles.css, line 93, and I can click on it and go to the correct place. So that source map is working. I'm sorry I didn't do a demo for the JavaScript, but it's essentially the same thing. All right, our final final task for today, minifying your dist code. Because what's the point of all of this unless you're going to make it smaller, right? <laughs> so we're going to use the plugin Uglify. As of Webpack 2, Uglify comes with Webpack by default, so you don't even have to install it as an extra thing. All you have to do is go to your plugins array and say, I want to use Uglify. That's it. Add it in. It's done. Let's have a look at what it's like at the moment, because I didn't show you the bundle earlier. This is what it looks like. It's got a lot of comments, got a lot of Webpack stuff in there. I've also added in this um, prod option, because as I said, we weren't building to the dist folder anymore. So instead of running uh, npm run dev, I'm going to do npm run prod, so that I actually get a build. I added uglify.js plugin to my plugins. And now in my dist folder, I get this minified version of my bundle. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's like a work of art. <laughs> Who knew JavaScript could be so beautiful? All right, so some takeaways. <laughs> Duh, I know. All right, so task runners and bundlers are different beasts. Task runners are a really good way to get started um, if you just want to make all your files a little bit smaller and better for, uh, for shipping. Um, but a bundler will really help you optimize your code and make sure you're following those trees and only putting in the code that you really, really need. Um, it also lets you really highly customize. So you can do things like making sure that your icons are put in as base64 encoded strings, whereas your larger images are left out and loaded externally. You can do a lot of cool stuff like that. Um, Webpack's minimum requirements are actually really, really small. Despite what you'll find online, it all looks very intimidating. It is actually very easy to start out. And as I showed you, you can just bundle the JavaScript and stop there. That is still a really good place to start. Um, loaders. So loaders can be used to pass non-JavaScript files to your bundler. The loaders are all about knowing how to read certain file types. And plugins can do some extra cool stuff. Um, that, you know, we only just touched on it today. There's a lot of really, really cool ones out there, um, especially ones that will look at your, um, kind of the shape of your bundle. So it'll actually tell you which of your includes are taking up the most space. So you can really get in there and, and optimize. Um, it is a rabbit hole, honestly. Once you start, you can't stop. It's like Pringles. Um, but it's, it's a rabbit hole totally worth going down. I, I only got into this a couple of months ago, and I just can't stop finding ways to optimize my app ever since. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Is that on? Is that working? Yep. Yep, cool. 
Um, so that's the last talk for the for the uh, day today. Remember, there are drinks at Max, and Jen also wants.